G'day folks. Oh, welcome to a uh, extra windy Ramblatronic. Uh, what's today? Wednesday. It's almost the last day of the week. Well, for me anyway. Working week, that is. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of windy at the moment, so expect a bit of background noise. It's just picking up now and going nuts. But, as you can see, not much has changed over here. <laughs> As always, I've got to tidy this area up and do something with some of this stuff. But anyway, just sorting out messages and things. Uh, recent message I got was, what cars do I currently have? Uh, I wanted to know whether I have the BMW and all that sort of stuff. And Well, starting with the BM, that's not here anymore. I sold that to one of Jay the Aussie's friends, who has a couple of them as well as spare parts units and he's quite wrapped with it, he's actually doing it up rather than scrapping it like he originally thought. Wow, the weather really took a turn for the worst. Okay. We're in for nasty weather, as, you, as they always say. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, Jay's friend's really happy with the BM, so... That's really good, it's gone to a good home, someone who's going to care for it and uh, piece it back together again with good second-hand parts, which I simply couldn't justify spending the money on. Uh, I don't have two racks sitting around to pick parts off. So, luckily he has, and he can uh, pillage whatever bits that he needs and do it for virtually nothing. Whereas I'd have to go out and buy all the bits and just spend more money than that car was worth. Um, yeah, so that's gone. The 3 Series, I still get questions about the 3 Series. That has not been here for a long time. I sold that to a racing guy. He wanted panels and wheels and things, so it had a good set of tyres on it and a good set of steel wheels, which he's going to use, and uh, a lot of good body panels, because you, know, you rub, rub shoulders with the guy next to you, you're going to take some paint off and put some dents in things. So, yeah, he took it for parts and whatever. Uh, the engine always had a blown head gasket, even though it ran perfectly fine. It was a really nice... 2.3 litre straight six. That thing was an animal in the wet. I wish it was in better condition or I bothered roadworthying it and actually keeping it in my name. But no, nah, that's gone to God now. But at the moment, yeah, I got the... I don't have the Jag either. Brad, Brad's missus bought the Jag, but he seems to be the one driving it most of the time. I think it's too practical. So, they're both, they both own that car. Uh, that's really good because, well... And the amount of time it was down here, like eight months, it got more rust on it than it did in about ten years up in the city. And I am down on Mornington Peninsula, I'm not going to say where, but there's a lot of salt in the air when you live close to the sea. And things rust, things around here rust. We get a really a few humid days and even stuff like the lathe, which hasn't rusted in ages, just gets a, a coating of rust over everything, even though they're oiled. It's nasty stuff. So... Yeah, be careful if you live close to the seaboard, because things do rust. Uh, it's nowhere near as bad as, say, the US, where they salt the roads in winter, and cars are lucky to last eight years before they fall to pieces. Um, probably a good market for second-hand engines and things, because the car will fall to bits before the engine and transmission does. Whereas over here, the engine and transmission are dead before the rest of the car is falling apart. Well, in most cases. Unless you really neglect it and abuse it. Or it's made in the UK. <laughs> A lot of the old Pommy cars just rust out. The Jags always rust out. And that's why that Series 1 was so good. It had minimal rust, but I had nowhere to protect it and store it, like, in a closed garage and work on it. So it just, it was going to shit. So I did the merciful thing and sold it off. I will get another one one day. It was a great car when it was working. <laughs> another typical Jag thing, but it was sort of more a bad fuel issue. I got some really bad fuel and hammered those carburetors to pieces. One of the throttle butterflies was just loose. The screws had come loose. So Jag's not here. Right now all I have is the Ford Fairmont, which has been a rock-solid car so far. Um, it's got a lot of life left in it. Nice, strong engine. I've done the major service, which I still haven't gotten around to uploading the rest of the videos on. But, yeah, it's all good and done. So Fairmont's going to be around for a while. The Micra's here. I love that thing to bits because it's just so easy to drive and so, so good on fuel. Uh... Still got more work to do on it, still got to fit the radiator and everything, but I've just been driving it on the weekends, it's great fun. Uh, I want more, yeah. Definitely going to hang on to the Micra. Uh, and the Mazda Tribute, probably not. I just don't have the room or the time or the money for another car project at the moment. 
So no, nah, no more car projects apart from the ones I've already got. And in future we'll look at, say, uh, first choice is a Toyota RAV4. I've always wanted one and being Toyota, I've seen them for sale with 400,000 Ks on them and they still want six grand for them, which is pretty ridiculous. Oh, sorry, four, four grand for one with 400,000 Ks. That's pretty ridiculous, but then it is a Toyota and everyone thinks they're made out of gold. So it's the main reason I put off them at the moment. People want too much for them. They're not actually worth that much. But I guess, yeah, they're a decent car. The Toyota reliability is Toyota reliability. As long as you change the timing belt, they don't shit themselves that often. So first choice was the RAV4, second choice was a Mazda Tribute. Um, I'm not sure if the American ones are assembled in America, but the Australian ones are assembled in Japan, so... I'm not sure there. I've got a couple of um, private messages from American owners saying they were garbage, but I've got a feeling they're assembled in America over there, the left-hand drive market. I don't know, I might be wrong, but I've heard really good reports about the Australian ones, so they could be made in a different plant with different components. Don't know. We'll find out. So, yeah. Roughly the $1,000 mark. That's about all I'd spend on a modern SUV that needs engine work and that sort of thing. Uh, there is one RAV4 on car sales for $1,200. guy's been trying to sell it for about 12, 18 months now. But it's got no rego, no nothing, and it's got front-end front collision damage. So there's a fair bit of money in fixing that up, and then by the time you fix it, you could have bought another one that's already on road. I'm guessing that's why the guy hasn't got his money for it. Like, he'd be lucky to get 500 bucks, to be honest. I should just call him and say, hey, I'll give you 500 bucks for the damn thing. <laughs> it's about all it's worth. But, yeah, people want too much for cars these days, especially junky ones or worn-out ones. You've got to know what they're worth. Yeah, anyway, that's enough on cars. Question of the day. Is there a standard wiring code for PIRs? I can't remember who suggested using one to trigger a doorbell, but I can't even get this thing to light up or do anything. There's a red LED under there that's supposed to blink when it's de when it's dormant and then light up when it's detected something, I guess. I've got 5 volts going to this one and 5 volts going to this one, which is just dead. There's no LED or anything. But I can't really get it to do much. It does have an anti-tamper switch, which is depressed at the moment. But I'm not sure what to trigger. There's MS1, which is these two. R and T have had nothing connected to them on either of these. There's the relay contact, which is the blue and the white, and then there's power. So, eh, any ideas? If anyone wants to let me know how to wire these things up, let me know. Unless that's actually an on-off switch, but I'm hesitant to bridge power to anything at the moment without blowing them up, although that one looks like it's already dead. It's got no light or anything on it. But yeah, if anyone knows how to... If anyone knows there's a standard for these codes, these wiring pinouts, uh, let me know because I've done a lot of Google searching and there's a million different sites advertising different PIRs and they're just going off colour coding. Like red, go red wire goes into pin 1, blue wire goes into pin 3. And that's kind of pointless because it doesn't tell me what it does. Likewise, that was with them but it's from a completely different system. It's wireless. It's got no remotes or anything so pretty much junk. Looks like the programmable ROM chip in there, EEPROM or something processor but yeah I thought that might have been part of its base unit that I could reverse engineer but it's not it's got something completely different it's a different brand of system and it's used for something else and the terminal block on it's got polling loop and auxiliary power input 12 volt DC the rest of that is just crap so yeah it's all rubbish but anyway I guess I better clean up and do some more productive stuff. As long as it keeps raining, I'm going to be in here for a while. And once again, we'll have a weekend of rain. Just after a couple of days of nice 22 degree weather. Wonderful. <laughs> Anywho, that's about all for now. Rambled on way too long tonight. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And thanks for watching.